it's live now. Fantastic. It's almost two o'clock, so we'll give everybody just another minute to join us and then we'll dive into today's meeting. All right, let's get started. Thank you to everyone for joining us today for the AMA's first webinar in our educational series. My name is Kelly Montez. I'm the owner of Apostrophe and I'm also the president of the AMA board. For those of you who are just getting to know the AMA and who we are, we are the Artist Management Association. Um, and our goal is to bring resiliency and a collective voice to our industry through shared resources and a supportive community. Our primary focus is developing production guidelines and best business practices for the creation of non-union still photography and motion content. Our goal is to grow our industry's sense of community through collaboration and education, which is why I am so excited to introduce all of you to our AMA partner, Ratbook. We have with us today, Cameron Woodard, uh, who is the co-founder Lauren Downey, who is the Senior Director of Payroll and Tax, as well as AJ Unitas, uh, who is the Head of Marketing. I can also say from personal experience, Apostrophe uses Wrapbook to manage our crew and payroll, and they have given my organization back so much time. I'm really excited to be sharing them as a resource with all of you today. We have happy crews and happy artists, and they make the payroll process so smooth um, and we appreciate them so much because they're always a very valuable resource for us whenever we have any questions. So I wanna turn it over to our friends and, and have them dive in a little bit more into today's 101 on payroll. Awesome. Cameron and, or Lauren, do you wanna take it away? Yep, I would thank you very much for everybody, everybody for joining us. Um, very excited to be here and thank you so much, Kelly, for giving us the time and allowing us to, to have this conversation. Um, today, what I think we'll do is we're gonna just dive into payroll 101. What are the things that you really need to know about processing your payroll? Um, can we go on to the next slide? I think what I'd like to do first is maybe ask Cameron, if you'd like to say a little bit about wrap up, tell us, who we are, how you found us, and uh, you know. Absolutely, it's uh, it's really a, a privilege to be here today. Thanks to the AMA and thanks to all of you for showing up and uh, getting getting a taste of this first event that AMA is putting on. Um, Rapbook is a technology platform that is built on top of a payroll service, and so. What that does is it allows for all of the kind of incredible experiences you've come to expect from your technology and applying it to your very, very painful experience life in the payroll side of things. And so what we've found is that Wrapbook has um, really solved a lot of pain in the lives of producers who are, you know, it says it right there, onboarding, casting crew, dealing with time cards, the payroll, the insurance. We're gonna dig into that today, Lauren specifically. And uh, the technology enables a lot of paper-based processes to be turned into digital, digital first processes for you. Uh, and then in addition to kind of that classic payroll function, it unlocks a lot of value for producers and casting crew members today. So things like having a single source of truth for who you've paid, when you've paid them, on what products, uh, pardon me, on which productions. And then in addition, just like really cool things like QuickBooks integrations and auto calculating time cards and things like that. So that's us at Wrapbook. We definitely encourage you to check us out, wrapbook.com, schedule a demo, watch a demo. We, we're really excited what we're building and we're really excited about the community that's forming around the product as well. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Cameron. Really appreciate it. So we're gonna go ahead and get started and we'll talk a little bit about payroll. Um, I would like to say if anybody has any questions that they want answered right down at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A section. Please feel free as we're moving along to go ahead and enter your questions. Um, if they're real specific in nature, we'll try and answer them direct or um, we may go ahead and just uh, answer them at the end when we have an open Q&A um, session. So what's payroll? 
Well, that's a pretty easy one, right? It's a, it's a method that you're using to pay employees for either services that they've performed or um, work that they've done for you. you it, it's really a financial function, usually sits in your, um, on your uh, financial side of the world. And it's a designated amount of money that you agree to with your employee that you're going to pay. And there's lots of rules that we're going to get into next on, on how you go ahead and do that. So what's the difference between payroll and entertainment payroll? There's really not much difference. Every single industry has their own complexities and their own nuances. And entertainment payroll is really no different. Do they have some pretty pretty funky rules? Yeah, I think they have some pretty funky rules. And we're going to get into talking about that a little bit. But at the end of the day, really, they all still have to abide by jurisdictional rules and regulations that are put out for us by the IRS and the different state agencies. So what are some of the overarching complexities of payroll that we see? Certainly the worker type, we're going to talk about that. I think in this industry specific, that that's something that, that a lot of people struggle with. Um, Location. Am I? Where am I? Where am I doing my work? Am I in my resident state or in my non-resident state? Union contracts, probably one of the biggest complexities in this industry. Um, kit fees. We'll talk about how do we report those and what does that mean. Um, and what are some project hurdles that that maybe we can help enlighten you on? So worker type. As I said, this is probably one of the biggest questions that we get: is are my workers an employee? or are they individual contractors? And at the end of the day, as much as you'd like to say, they're just an individual contractor because that's what they are. At the, it's really not up to you decide. It's not optional. Um, there's some real rules around how you categorize your employees and the IRS and all the different states get to tell you that you can't decide uh, on your own. So. First and foremost, what do employees and contractors, what do they get? And there's a difference between the things that we need to give them. So here on the employee side and similar to the contracting side, right? Everybody needs to receive a compliant pay stub. Here's where we start to differ. On an employee side of the house, you have taxes withheld from their pay. The employer is gonna pay certain taxes. The employee is gonna pay certain of the year and we're gonna issue them a W-2. On the contractor side of the house, they're not paying taxes. The employer is not paying taxes on their behalf. You are self-employed. You'll get a 1099. You're going to complete self-employment taxes. Usually most labor laws do not apply to you. Um, and you're gonna get that 1099 at the end of the year. And there's different types of 1099s depending on the type of wages um, that, that, you're, that you're making. So how do you classify your workers? Here's the sticky part of it. There's, there's rules and regulations put out by the IRS that tell you how you're gonna classify your workers. And there's simple tests that you can take. There are about 12 different states that have different variations of those rules. You can go on to the next slide, please. There are about 12 different states that, um, that help you decide which one that, that your employees should be. For the sake of today's conversation, we're really gonna talk a little bit about, about California. Just know that overarching, they all revolve around test. There's a common law test. There's an ABC test. Hey, is, anyone, is Lauren breaking up for anyone else? Hey, Laura, just let you know. Yes, you're, you're, you're... as I was saying a moment. One of the joys of working from home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, Lauren, are you there? You, you kind of got auto tuned for a second uh, and then lost you. Uh, okay. Yeah, maybe Hopefully. we can pass the mic to, I am. Can you, to your camera because I know that this test is something that's changed in this last year and is definitely very important for, for all of us to understand how, how you classify this. So maybe AJ or Cameron, you could you could step in and give us a little bit more background on this. Let's see if, if Lauren's mic uh, gets hot again. Lauren, are you there? Yeah, let me see. Uh, I Can you hear me now? 
but it's breaking up quite a bit. Maybe if we turn off the video, maybe we can the, we'll increase the. No. Uh -oh, I, I think okay. we lost her. Um, I think I'm going to, would it be okay if I log out and log back in? Well, now that you have your video off, we actually can hear you pretty well. You want to try moving forward that direction? Oh, you can? Yeah, I think Absolutely. you might have to too many things. Yeah. Great. Let, perfect. Let me know if, if I start to break up again. Well, do. So worker eligible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. You broke up again. Yeah, I think maybe jump out and then jump back in. Oh, require oh, everyone. So while we hold for this for a little bit, I know that this is something that's really changed and something that we all need to understand a bit more um, in part because of the CARES Act. So definitely hold on and wait for, for Lauren to come back and, and fill us in. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, the reason why I punted it back to her is while I can speak to this in terms of a truthful general answer, one of the great things about having Lauren on the team is just her deep well of expertise on this subject itself. So I really want to extend her expertise to the members and to those who are here with us today. She'll be back on. Really happy uh, that folks are here with us. And of course, if there's any questions, we're always happy to address them as well. But uh, sorry about that. We'll no problem. I know this is one of those things too that gets a little bit tricky for for me, even when I'm hiring crew as well, and and explaining to them why I can't necessarily pay them on a 1099 anymore, and and giving them that background and giving them that education. And it's been so great having you guys as partners to help navigate that. Hey, Lauren, can you hear us again? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, let's give it another try. Let's start the slide over. Okay, I am going to keep my video off in, in hopes that that helps. Sounds good. All right, so I think we've already really talked about this screen, uh, this slide anyway. So there's, there's multiple tests that you can take. They all have the same basic classifications. It's the behavioral control, your financial control, and your relationship that you have with the company that you're doing work for or that you're doing service for. Let's go ahead and, and we'll go on to the next page. As I said, we're gonna concentrate a little bit more on California for today, but again, just know there's about 11 or 12 states. They all have a different variation, but all basically the same. So when we talk about control, control is, are they free from the control of direction? So are you telling that person what they need to do every single day, or are they allowed to say, I'm going to perform this, I'm gonna do it the way that I do it. And at the end of it, I'm going to give you whatever that product or whatever that is that you need. Um, do they perform it outside the usual course of, of work? So are you, did you bring me in as a private or separate contractor to perform a specific thing that's outside of the work that your company generally does? If not, I'm probably an employee. Or is it engaged, or am I engaged in independent trade similar to the, the, the contract that they have with you? It's important to note that it's you can't choose, oh, wait, they're, they're, they do C, but oh, not really A and B. You have to meet all three in order to be considered a, a 1099 or a W-2. And at the end of the day, if you're not sure, all of your employees are always going to be considered W-2 employees unless you prove otherwise. And there's some you know, penalties and things that the state agencies could, could impose um, if you decide to choose it, it the wrong way. So we'll talk about the things that we collect that are also different between an employee and a, a private contractor. So mandatory forms such as employees, they're going to fill out a W-4, they're going to fill out an I-9, they're going to fill out a state certificate for those states that don't align with the IRS W-4. Um, on the contractor side, this less information that we really need, they're going to fill out a W-9 for you. On the optional side, this is really going to be up to you when you, when you hire your employees and what are the things that you as a business require. This is not an exhaustive list. This is just a sampling. 
you could require your employees to submit other documentation. Again, that's going to be up to you and the relationship that you have and what your business processes are. These are some forms that we happen to see um, pretty often. Um, and then on the other side is what do I need to give an employee versus what do I need to give to a contractor? We talked about it earlier on, right? Pay stubs that are state compliant. And then at the end of the year, we're going to give an employee a W-2, which reconciles all the pay that you've given them throughout the year. On the contractor side, well, it's going to depend. They're going to get a 1099 form. The NEC, new as of 2020, is going to have their wages. And then the miscellaneous is going to be things like kit fees. And we'll talk about kit fees in a little bit. And again, you always have optional forms that you as a business might decide that you also want your employees um, that you want to give your employees, such as crew deal memos. Next. Kit fees. So I, so I mentioned that a moment ago. Kit fees. Is it a wage? Is it a reimbursement? Well, it's really neither one. But a kit fee is really more of a rental fee. And it's what you're charging for your property for the production to use. And it gets reported on a different 1099. The kit fee goes on a 1099 miscellaneous, whereas your regular wages are going to go now on a 1099 NEC. And there's different types of wages that you might make, right? We talked about kit fees, mileage, up to the first 56 cents. That's just a plain old reimbursement. After the 2021 uh, um, amount for, for your kit fees, then it just becomes regular taxable wage that you're going to include in, in your W-2 for your employee or on your 1099 at NEC. Production expenses, you pay $5 for something, we're gonna give you back $5 for something. It really doesn't get reported anywhere. Next. So probably one of, not probably, definitely one of the most um, complex parts of, a, of this industry's payroll are dealing with all of the different union contracts. You need to think about which contract is it? What role do I play? What are the scale rates? Have they changed? How many hours? How many guaranteed hours? Meal penalties, sick penalties, right? There's a, a thousand different things that you really need to think about when you're thinking about um, your union contracts. I will stop here for just a moment. I do want to say that we're not going to go deep into unions for right now. Um, we're going to really keep it high level. But we'll come back and do another union one um, and we'll really dig deep if that's what the, um, everyone would like to see. But for today, we're just going to we're going to keep it high level. So at a glance, we know this already. Unions add a whole bunch of rules and a whole bunch of co complexities on top of the regular standard payroll procedures. Rules that include things like pay rates, fringe benefits and frequency requirements. A lot of states, California being one, New York being another one, will work with the jurisdictional agencies to have special rules in place just for them. So there's FLSA rules that are going to apply for just, the, um, just this industry in certain states. In other states, th those, those separate rules don't apply. You have to think about things about becoming a signatory. Um, for the specific rules that uh, the unions that you're going to be using. And you have to think about representation and, and making sure that talent agencies get their pay um, as well. So pay frequency. Pay frequency really, really has a lot to do with the amount of money. It plays a huge role in, um, in In, in creating a paycheck for, for your employees. At a high level, what is it? It's something that you're paying. You're gonna set them up on a bi-weekly or a semi-monthly basis, and you're gonna pay them on, I don't know, the 15th and the end of the month, every single time. Um, in this particular industry, the payroll is driven by how large, how, how the length of the project is it a weekend project? Is it a one week? Is it two months? And certainly, as we talked about the complexity of those, those, those union rules, what type of a production is it? Where is it being held? And what is the different regulations with regard to the, the, the titles and the people that, that you're employing? So 
So pay frequency. See, also, as I said earlier, has a lot to do about the email dating. Lauren, we're actually losing you a bit again. Um, I don't know, Kelly, did she cut out for you in the middle of pay, pay, pay frequency as well? She did. Um, I think we can pick it up on location and local talent travel. I know that some of us in our industry are dealing a little bit more with unions as we're starting to have that crossover. But Lauren, if you're able to to hear us, we're back on to the we're back on the slide. That's location with local talent and travel. And it looks like I'm not getting anything from from Lauren. Maybe it died. How about now? I can. Yeah, you're back. Yes. <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, okay, so location. Location, when, when we talk about payroll, where you work and where you live plays a huge part in your taxation. Um, you can go on to, yeah. So if I live in one state and I work in the other, there could be different rules depending on the state on what taxes are going to be taken from your pay. A multi-state shoot, means multi-state taxation. So almost like a pay and play. Where I live, where I work is going to make sure that I am taxed appropriately. And then a production has to decide, is it less expensive for me to hire local talent or do I bring my entire production crew with me to a certain location and pay them um, in, in that way? So project hurdles. Hmm. Where are we going to? Oh, actually, Cameron, I think we can we can do this slide. Um, but yeah, basically, something we want to talk about was the idea that every single time you're doing a project and you're bringing on employees, it's almost kind of like you're hiring a full time employee. It's actually exactly the same process. Um, all the things you need to do if you're running a full time company, like vetting the person, I-9 verification, W-2s and workers' comp insurance, which Cameron can talk a little bit more in a second. Like all those things you have to do for like what you'd call like a employee in any other industry, you have to do every single time you have a production. Oh, Cameron, did you want to jump in about workers' comp? Yeah, happy to jump in about workers' comp. So workers' comp is a mandatory insurance coverage that you need to supply to your workers uh, as you hire them to work on your projects and for your company. Um, workers' comp insurance indemnifies or holds your organization harmless for injury or illness that occurs to a worker while under your employment. And in exchange for that, your insurance will cover uh, their oftentimes convalescence, disability, and treatment. It's, uh, it's absolutely necessary. And one of the hurdles for this and one of the ways that entertainment payroll companies like Rapbook are very helpful is that as you pay your employees through it, the workers' compensation is covered to them there. So it's just another one of these mandates that can make the process of hiring short-term workers even more complex. And Rapbook makes that much, much easier. And Karen, the nice thing too is once you onboard a crew member in the Rapbook system, they're already onboarded. It's it's step and repeat for future productions. You're not gathering this paperwork every time since they're already in that wrap book system. Absolutely. And that creates benefits on both sides of the equation. You know, for those of you that are on today and you've worked as cast or crew, like the process of filling out the I-9 and the NDAs and the W-2s over and over and over again when you're working on multiple jobs with multiple companies in a single month is just as tedious as it is for the production accounting and production uh, project manager crews. You know, nobody likes it. And so one of the th ways that the technology of Rapbook has really sped up this particular painful process is exactly what you said, Kelly, which is to say, once you have a Rapbook profile, your preferences are saved and that profile can be employed by any other company that works on the Rapbook platform. And so onboarding can be cut honestly more than in half, which saves time for you to get to work, which is, as we all know, 
constrained by time and is expensive if we go over. So uh, this particular process is mandated and used to be extremely painful. And we've used technology to make that process, dare I say it, enjoyable. <laughs> no, not enjoyable, but, but better. But Definitely so better. much easier. And this is, this is part of what I was talking about at the beginning where I know that you've given my organization back so, so much time. That's awesome. Yeah, you know, one of the things that's also really neat, neat about the hiring process is that yes, you have to go through all this complexity, but you also need to be able to report to your workers that you paid them. And in production, that classically had been very challenging because paper checks were going in the mail, producers jumped to a different job with a different company after a shoot day's over, and then inevitably the accounting department or the head of production is getting emails from people going, where's my pay? The great thing with Raplook is that because it's hosted and online, as a worker, as you log in, you can actually see the status of your time card as it moves through the process or the head of production, the production company, even if they weren't on set, can look up your name and see the status of uh, your payment. And as well, there's another really nice thing in the system and that workers can get free checks, but you can also get ACH. And we actually just did an ROI study with 30 of our customers. And one of the things that was interesting in terms of a data point that we got back was that in some cases, or in most cases, folks were getting paid nine days faster than what they were getting paid when, when paid by other solutions because the process of calculating the time cards and, and moving all the paper and then mailing it in or emailing it, it just, it just accrued a lot of time, which then ultimately resulted in people getting paid slower. So this kind of hyperspeed hiring for part-time work, that's really where we focus. And that's really what we aim to, to help you all with at Wrapbook. Yeah, and, and like Cameron said, with Wrapbook, it, it's able to take a lot of these hyper-repeatable things and automate them. But without a Wrapbook-type solution, if you're trying to stay truly compliant, it will feel a little tease to go through every single step every single time because you have to. Um, yeah. Cool. Um, and, and paying crew in a timely manner, is, there's legal implications to it as well for production. So absolutely. It's valuable as it is with any other payroll provider, right? And again, we talked earlier on that this industry payroll is similar to, to any other industry payroll. There's rules and regulations around how often you need to pay, when you need to pay them by. Um, so to, to answer your question, Kelly, yeah, it, it, there's a lot of rules around and a lot of legality around being compliant for, for, for paying your employees. You know, and it leads right into this next slide where we talk about can I process a payroll without a production company, a, a production payroll company? Yeah, you can. I would question whether you want to or not, but you absolutely can do it. There are so many things that you need to think about in order to process even one employee's paycheck. And if you times that by multiple locations, then you're, you're really thinking about a huge bit of, of work that really needs to, done, to be done, right? You need to register in every state where you film or where you work. You, you need to pay the appropriate um, taxes. So you'll need to make sure that you're using the appropriate tax tables, withholding at the right rate, taking into consideration those W-4s and state certificates. You also have to deposit all that tax that you've now withheld and that you have, as a company owe, you have to deposit it to the appropriate state using the appropriate deposit frequency that is picked out just for your company. And then you have to recon reconcile all of that on quarterly and, and annual tax returns. And you have to reconcile all of that to your W-2s and 1099s at the end of the year. So could you? Sure, you could. Do you want to? Uh, uh, probably not. <laughs> well, and on this note too, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, Rapbook is then also the employer of record. So if there's yes. any sort of unemployment claims, it's not say apostrophe dealing with it. It's actually Rapbook that handles mm -hmm. that interaction as well. As, uh, that's absolutely correct. We, we do as the employer of record and we, we also take care of all of the state and, and federal tax filing. So yeah. It's important to, to talk about that specifically. And yeah. that's why we're jumping into this next slide is because look, we're not the first entertainment payroll company to exist. As you can see, the payroll compliance 
is such a hurdle that it is worthy and necessary for payroll companies to exist inherently. But where we're different and why I think many people are choosing to work with us here at Wrapbook is that we've built the software interface that works with that classic financial payroll service. And when those two things meet, it creates a lot of added value for you, which is the faster onboarding. There's actually even a crew database in the Wrapbook product. So as you're hiring and onboarding your workers across all of your different productions, that inherently creates a database for you or your, your coordinators or, your, or your, your participants in your Wrapbook profile to like look up, hey, where wasn't there a PA in Philadelphia we worked with that one time? And then boom, you can find them. And so it becomes a very useful accruing tool. Uh, another thing that we didn't talk about, but Lauren dug into the fact that there are documents that you must have people sign. And there's also documents that you may want people to sign. Rapid also has an e-signature product built into it. So if you have custom NDAs, if you have uh, special contracts, you can just copy and paste them into the platform and the system is going to make all of that miscellaneous crew start work absolutely automated. So it's a, it's a really powerful thing when you introduce software to kind of legacy services. And that's really it. Wrapbooks, our, our mission here at the company, and we've written this down, we take it seriously, is to increase the prosperity of the project economy through better financial services. And so we believe that technology enabled financial services actually can save everybody a lot of time and a lot of money. So that's what we're doing. Great. So common questions and I, go ahead, AJ. I was going to say, just kind of introduce it too. Yeah, basically, before we get into the questions you guys have been submitting, um, we thought we might tackle some of the most common ones we're seeing um, and things that we've seen producers bring up. Um, yeah, I was just giving a little intro, Lauren. I don't want to steal okay. your thunder. No, that's fine. Go ahead. So this one is one that we 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 talked about. We we talked about earlier on. It has to do with pay frequency. We get this question all the time. Why have you taken so much money out of my paycheck? Well, we look at your W-4, we look at your state certificates, and we look again at the frequency at which you were paid. We bump that up against the state and, and federal regulations, and we calculate what those taxes should be. It really has to do with the frequency that you're paid and the amount of money um, that you're paid. We have a, calc the IRS has a calculator that you can use. So if you think that we're taking too much taxes, you can tell us that you, you want to be classified in a different way uh, on your W-4, and we can supply a link to the IRS calculator, which is really a pretty easy way of understanding whether or not you're being withheld at the right rate. How do I complete my W-4? It's kind of the same as what I was talking about a moment ago, is the IRS now released, as of 2020, that new W-4. So it used to take you about two seconds to fill out you, you, you add a couple of exemptions, one, two, three, whatever you like, you sign your name, you hand it in and you're good. So now it's a full fledged tax return. And there's a lot of things that you need to think about and you need to think about how you're filing your taxes. Do, is your, your partner also have an income and do you wanna claim a joint income? Uh, again, I would refer you to that IRS tax calculator. It is the simplest way to know if you're entering that data and you can play with it to get different net pays to figure out, am I being withheld at the rate that I think that I should? And Lauren, when, when crew are coming to our producers or are coming to us as agents and asking us these questions, that's a service that Wrapbooks provides to where we can kick the crew back to you guys to, to help field those questions and make sure that we're giving the right answers. Sometimes when I'm answering the complexities on someone's pay, I, I kind of freeze up of like, am yeah. I saying it right? Yeah, we absolutely, again, we are that employer of record. So we talk to your employees and your workers all the time. In, in true transparency, can I tell somebody how to fill out their W-4? I can't do that. But what I can do is I can show them the guidelines. I can show them how to do the calculator, how to decide if they're making the best decision for themselves so that they can go in, they can complete it, and they can say, okay, I feel, I feel comfortable now. 
what pay frequency is being used when processing my payroll. So that's set up at the project level. When, when the payroll admin goes in, they decide when they're making, when they're creating those pays, whether they're gonna pay for one week, two week, three weeks, four weeks. So that's all decided up front when the project is being created and built. All right, I think that those were the most ones that we had. Maybe we'll field some of the questions now that, that people have been writing in. We have a few. Um, do you want me to just kick in or AJ, do you want to facilitate? Totally up to you. Uh, I want to give this over to Kelly if that's cool. If you want yeah. to go through the questions. Yeah, yeah. and, and one, of, one of, uh, our, our listeners here today asked a question that I had actually wanted to go back to um, and just hear a little bit more about labor wages versus kit fees, because that's mm -hmm. definitely a question that I know I have encountered where kit fees and expense um, and, and how, that gets, how that gets reported out and, and how we can explain to our crew members that that's not becoming a taxable income for them. Can you, can you clarify that just a little bit more for us? Yeah, I absolutely can. Um, so yeah, so your kit fees are really rental income. What you're saying is here's my equipment. I'm going to bring it on set and you production, I'm going to charge you a rate to rent this equipment so that I can use it and you don't have to buy it. You're just going to rent it from me so that I can perform whatever job that I need to perform. Those are kit fees. Those go on your 1099 miscellaneous box one under rental income expenses they don't go on any type of return i spent five dollars you gave me back five dollars it's not taxable income we talk about mileage and i think there was another question in here about mileage so uh, oh, actually it's the same question so mileage up to the irs limit it's non-taxable it doesn't go anywhere so if i if i spent 56 cents that's it Anything above the 56 cents that I'm paying per mile that I'm paying goes and is included in your in your taxable wage. So it could be included on your W-2 as taxable wage if you're an employee, or it could be included in your 1099 if you're an individual contractor. Either way, that money needs to be needs to be considered taxable and tax needs to be calculated and paid on it. That's great. And that all gets deposited with the 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 payroll as well at the same time. Yep. Fantastic. And then another question, which is very specific, but one I have also gotten when I've hired this key crew me member before, a digital tech who comes with their own equipment and they're either an S Corp or an LLC. They also carry their own insurance, they carry their own workers' comp. Mm -hmm. Can they qualify as an independent contractor? Sounds like it, because it sounds like they pass all three of the tests, right? They, they work independently, they are their own company, they're coming, you're not directing their work, you're not telling them how to do their work, when they need to arrive and when they need to go home. They work independently, to do their job and then they go home. So sounds to me like that could be an, an independent contractor. What happens if they do not have their own, if they're just an LLC and mm -hmm. they don't have workers comp? Workers comp is not part of the test. The test doesn't say anything about workers comp. If they carry it, that's great but it doesn't have anything to do with the, the test. It only has to do with the three points that we talked about earlier. Would you advise that we, I'm trying to think about how exactly to ask this question because I think that we've done this before where we haven't run them f through full payroll for you, but we have run them through so that they are covered under the workers comp policy within our job. Does that, yeah. am I, does that make sense? It does, it does. And actually- That's what I'm trying to say to everybody. I think I get it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I get it. Basically, can an independent contractor be covered under your workers' comp insurance policy? And I think in many cases, yes. Cameron, I don't know if you want to jump in um, to talk a little bit about that. 
The answer is yes. So what people are talking about here in this case is a loan out, right? And there's some interesting information about loan out. So the question is a little bit off somewhat, right? So like you, you can have an LLC, which can be taxed as a pass through, which is no different than like an individual branching out with their own venture, but you get the protection of an entity through the LLC. But that LLC can also be elected to tax itself as a C Corp or as an S Corp. In the cases that it's elected to be taxed as an S or a C Corp, it can qualify IRS scrutiny to be qualified as a quote unquote loan out. If it's a single member LLC and it has elected for pass through taxation, you're really not going to be able to qualify for getting around the payroll tax. Uh, that's just the rules. Um, as it relates to workers comp, if that entity and this is actually true for your contractors as well. If your contractors or your loan out employees are not covered by a workers' compensation policy that they hold, the employer who's hiring them to work is going to be liable for in the event of a claim that workers' comp is applied. And so when you run loan outs through the wrap up platform, we actually do extend our workers' compensation to those loan out workers but you get to get around those payroll taxes if they elected to be taxed as truly their own S or C corp entity. Um, the, the way that that question was phrased in the question, that sounds like it really would be an entity to entity transaction, not an entity to a worker transaction, in which case write an invoice and a PO and sayonara, good, have a good shoot. Yeah, I think, I think that important component of um, when you're needing to cover somebody on a workers' compensation policy uh, when they when they are loan out, but you still need to cover them. That there's costs that are associated with that, and 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 understanding what those costs are can affect budgeting. But it's important to make sure that they are covered under your workers' comp policy. Absolutely, you definitely do not want to be hiring any workers, regardless of their designation as loan out employee or contractor without workers comp. Um, not only because you are going to be liable for tremendous penalties for not doing so in the event of an audit, but also because we're literally talking about people's health and people do get hurt on film sets a lot more than other types of jobs. Uh, typically one way or the other, the worker will be compensated in some capacity, but potentially at the ruin of your own business. Yeah. Um, the next question is a very interesting one as well. Um, let's say that you're a producer from out of state mm -hmm. and you're traveling into California with crew as a California production. Oh, I'm sorry. So you're a California crew and you're and, and you're traveling to a state that doesn't have the payroll laws, do we still need to pay them as employees? Yeah, well, again- Is there any state that doesn't have, have these payroll laws? Every, if they don't have their own variation, I know I talked a little bit about, there's about 11 or 12 states that have their own variation. However, if they don't have their own variation, it goes back to the IRS regulation. So you still have to abide by that test. So if they are part of the production, if you're guiding their time, if they, right, if all of those items, A, B, and C are, are, are not being met, they are have to be an employee. You always consider an employee and then you're trying to prove them a, a 1099. Does that make sense? Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Cool. Um, this next question is something that is being asked by your producer, and it was something that was brought to light from uh, to the AMA by the AICP that has to do with how you talk to your crew, particularly in California, about day rates that there's no such thing as your 500 for a 10 or your 600 for a 12, that you need to communicate clearly to crew that your X amount for eight hours, your X amount for 10 hours, mm -hmm. and then your overtime beyond 10 is another 
amount um, yes. and how, how you break that down. And I know that um, there's a several class action lawsuits happening in California that are going after various production companies for reporting crew rates incorrectly or in a misleading fashion. Um, and that we were very happy to know that Ratbook manages that breakdown. But can you talk a little bit about how you how you communicate appropriately uh, day rates and hours? So when we talked earlier about having a compliant pay stub, we talk about making sure that we're reporting the hours on the pay stub as each state requires. So specifically in California, if they're um, if overtime needs to be shown or vacation time or sick time or whatever type of time that the employee is required to have, then we need to make sure that it's communicated to them as often as it's supposed to be communicated to them, to them again on that compliant pay stub. There's other communications that will be the responsibility of the production company, right? When you hire your employees, you're gonna have an agreement with them as well, whether it be regarding the union, around union um, rules and regulations or just whatever rules, if it's a non-union person, whatever rules that the state requires, there, there should be a communication from you to them as well as what we're providing on a per payroll basis. Great. Um, we have an audience member raising her hand. Jamie, I'm going to uh, mic you up. Um, can you please ask your question? Yeah. So I guess my, my main question is dealing with employee versus contractor. Can you give me an example of any job where a worker shows up who isn't told what the rules of engagement are at their job. I mean, from a machinist working at GM to a PA, someone's telling someone what time to show up and what they're supposed to be doing. So going way back to the beginning, yep. I, I just, I would love an example of any job where someone who's employed is not told what to do and they kind of do whatever they want. Yeah, and I, I think that we have to, uh, I'll think about an example of, of a title as I'm having this conversation, but not every job requires you to tell someone how they need to do it or what they need to do. You may hire someone as a project and say, by the end of a week, I need you to produce this for me. Can you do that? That's a contract that you're going to have and you're going to sign and you're going to say, he's that person is going to say to you, yes, I can do that or no, I can't. You can't tell them when they can show up. All you can tell them is at the end of the day, I need this done and I need it done by this time and can you do it? That's going to be an example of someone who comes in and says, yep, I can do that. I may not show up at eight, nine or 10, but if I have to have it done, by Friday, I'll have it done by Friday. And then you'll pay me for the overall project um, that I've done. I think we had an example earlier on um, where someone had asked just about that same question. If they have a person that shows up, they bring their own equipment, they have their own insurance, although that part doesn't matter quite as much. They work completely independently without direction and they come and go as they, as they please, but yet they just, all you need to know is that they're getting a job done and they're doing what you need them to do. So wouldn't that be someone like a like a location scout or the producer on yeah. on your job? A location scout could be a very good example, right? You're going to say, "I need to shoot. I want five locations for this particular suit, and I think I want it to be in this area." And they're going to go out, and then they're going to come back to you when they have a bunch of photos for you to look at, and then you're going to choose between them and maybe another location scout that went out on their own time maybe at a certain time of day because maybe the lighting is better or at a certain time because they knew no people were going to be around. So you didn't tell them when, you didn't tell them how, but you get to choose whether or not you're gonna use their locations. Got it. Okay, let's see. We've got lots of really great questions yeah. here. Um, oh, this is a wonderful question. 
If kid fees are considered rentals, should we be charging sales tax on those amounts? Is that something that you can speak to? I know that's yeah. a little payroll. <laughs> um, to my knowledge, no. Um, However, I will follow up on that question. I did see it there and I found it very interesting as well. Um, to, I don't believe you have to pay sales tax on those, um, but I would like to follow up on it. Yeah, we will, we will look into that. That's a really, that's a great, a great question. Um, Stacy Fisher, I'm gonna make you live to chat. Okay, Stacy, what's your question? I actually just wanted to speak to the sales tax issue. So if you are a set designer, now this is in New York state, you are required to play sales tax. That is not what everyone believes the industry standard is, but we had a very large sales tax audit. So I have been schooled. <laughs> so sales tax is really, really, complicated and depending on what kind of talent you're representing, you are required in New York state to pay sales tax. Thank you. Right, you, you learned by fire. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll make note of that because that's actually probably another really wonderful webinar that we can, we can dive into at, a, at another time. But yes, that's right, Stacey, you do have experience with that. Thank you. Thank you, no problem. Okay. Marilyn, I see your hand is up, and so I'm going to make you live as well. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them is, can a stylist be paid as an independent co contractor on his or her prep days and then paid as an employee on shoot days when they're told what time to be there and someone sort of, you know, directing them what, what wardrobe to put on the talent or where the props go. Um, can that, can it be split up that way? Uh, yeah, but from payroll perspective, if they're playing a different role and you are guiding their time and all of those other things apply, yes. Okay, so uh, on days when they're prepping on their own, they're an independent contractor. On days when they're on set, they're an employee. Mm -hmm. okay. Could be, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you mentioned earlier that, you know, we're not telling a digital tech what time to arrive or what time to go home, but actually we do, we do tell them that. So does that change things at all? If they're incorporated or they're yep. carrying their own comp, does it change anything because we do tell them what time to be on set? Yeah, it could. Because if you don't meet A, B, and C, they are a W-2 employee. Okay. Um, and then my last question, um, I, I worked with a producer recently who ran uh, everything through payroll and uh, payroll tax was charged on kit fees and mileage, uh, which I was quite surprised to see. Yep. Um, would that, is that normal or no? Kit fees are generally run on a 1099 um, mm -hmm. as, as I said, as rental right. income. Mileage could be um, because it is taxable wages if it's above the annual limit. Only if it's above the annual limit. Correct. Up to the annual limit, is, there's no taxation. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Sure. Appreciate it. Cameron, wanted, did you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to point out that Lauren made some very choice selections of words when answering that question about location kit scouts. And that was, yeah, could be. The question is... That's, that's on you as the employer to decide, right? You have to weigh the ABC test against every person that you're hiring. So could and is, the rule doesn't just hold, hey, when we're sending uh, location scouts out on prep days or, or people on prep days that we don't have to worry about it. Or when they, you have to really look at every single uh, role and see if they pass that test. And that is a burden in and of itself. We understand that. <laughs> uh, so it really is uh, up to your discretion. Oftentimes people will just run it as employee payroll because they don't need to, they don't need or want the added scrutiny of justifying to an auditor that no, see this was contractor and this wasn't. So it is up to you, of course. Interesting. Thank you, Cameron. Um, this I think is a really great 
question. Uh, should COVID testing stipends be entered for payroll that's part of the hourly taxable wage? Or is that something that is handled differently? A stipend is a stipend. It's not an hourly wage unless you're paying a person to be there for five hours to do COVID testing. So it's going to depend on the way that you've chosen to pay that employee. Okay. It is taxable wages. It is right? taxable. It is taxable yes. wages. It's not an expense. It is not an expense. It is a, it is a wage. Okay. Um, Denise Gilmartin, who uh, is an advisory board member for the AMA, as well as the VP of Business Affairs from the AICP, has her hand raised. Um, Denise, I'm making you live right now. Thanks, Kelly. I just wanted to follow up on what Cameron said about the location scout and was also discussed with the stylist who was working on their own and then showed up at the set. In California, I think that, that anybody who shows up on your set is going to be in, considered an employee because they're not going to pass the B in the ABC test, the, the one that says the worker performs work that is outside the usual course of the hiring entity's business. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm losing my voice. So anybody you hire to perform the services which you're selling, which is the photography shoot, is going to be an employee in California. Very well stated. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah. I also wanted to ask about the, um, you had a PowerPoint screen that talked about other documents that you might require. And yep. one thing that was on there was COVID-19 liability waivers. And I, I'm pretty sure it's in California, but I'm not sure about the rest of the country. But from my understanding, you can't ask an employee to waive any of their rights. So those would be right. unenforceable. Absolutely. So I guess maybe, Maybe you can ask an independent contractor. I don't know. Maybe that's what you meant by that. I think that that should be noted as a notice. You know, it is interesting. We've seen, we, we take an agnostic approach towards the documents that can be created in the platform. So producers can literally, if you have any sort of custom contract or custom document, you can mm -hmm. add it to a profile and have your cast and crew members sign it. The enforceability of that is, of course, going to be totally up to agencies outside of Wrapbook's purview. Uh, and I would say you're absolutely right. A waiver is exactly the wrong word here, but a notice is absolutely something that could fly uh, and be totally useful for cast and crew to understand how your production is going to go about uh, keeping a set safe. Yeah, I think this, this, sorry. Oh, I didn't jump on you, but I was going to say, additionally, if you go to our blog, we actually have a really in-depth post about this exact topic, where we had a uh, safety compliance services, a, a COVID like strategy company, and also the Advantage Testing, where they wrote it like at length about whether or not they are enforceable and kind of like the difference between a liability waiver or form and just trying to like break down like that you are really ultimately still responsible for the risk, but these things can like help provide almost sometimes a, a, a false sense of safety from a liability perspective. So I would definitely check that out if you haven't seen that. Yeah, I just didn't want people to think that they should be doing that because you, you shouldn't be asking your employees to waive their rights. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about was I think it went, it, part of it got dropped when we we're having technical difficulties, but it was about the pay periods. And I didn't really hear what, um, what she was saying, but it, also in California, that's where I am. So I, I talk about that a lot, but there, there, we recently were able to get an exemption for prints that went along with the entertainment industry as far as pay periods, because you had to pay them at the end of the day. Yep. And now um, you have to pay them the same time you would pay your staff payroll. So if you have set up for staff weekly payroll, you would mm -hmm. need to pay your crew and talent at the same time. So if you worked, yeah. if your pay period was the previous Monday through Friday and your payroll was paid on the following Friday, you would have to pay that crew right. and that talent during the same pay period for the yes. same time. I think at that point, what I was talking about is at the time when payroll is being processed and when the project is being set up that you can create the pay frequency that you need to use um, that makes sense for your for your project 
and so by all means, it, if you if your normal pay period is biweekly, then you would go in and you would choose biweekly to make sure that they're paid at the same time. Um, we're we're getting close to the end of the hour. I want to make time for for one more question. This one seems very specific, so I want to make sure that that this get gets answered for this person. Um, the question is, let's say I have an employee who is arguing to me that she deserves to be paid at time and a half after working seven days in a row per labor section 510. If I've already communicated to her that her daily rate was X amount, am I still liable? To be clear, this is for a still shoot. And I am going to guess based on so I think this person is that this is in California. Can you just repeat that question for me one more time? I, I want to make sure I, sure, I no, hear it. no problem. It's a, it's a, it's a hefty, it's a meaty one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ending on a doozy for you, Lauren. That's all right. Let's say I have an employee who is arguing to me that she deserves to be paid a time and a half after working seven days in a row per labor section 510. I've already communicated to her what her daily that her daily rate was X amount. Am I still liable considering that they've worked seven days in a row? I I have to think about the answer to this question because I think the seventh day is um, is where it might get a little bit tricky um, because. I don't know what the conversation would have been should they work that seventh day. A lot of times you have to think about, you know, you have to pay overtime once you get to that seventh day, um, even if you didn't have that conversation in, in advance. Um, yeah, that is tricky because you're supposed to have a down, you're supposed to have a down day after so many days. You right? do, but I think the seventh day throws in a bit of a wrench to that question because after that, on that seventh day, you do have to kick in um, what the overtime rules are. So I probably want to do a bit more um, research to make sure that I'm giving the right answer on that one. Okay. Hannah, email me. I'll make sure you get your, <laughs> your question asked. Um, we're at the top of the hour. I love all of these questions. This is so amazing. And I really appreciate everyone coming here today and participating. Um, this is the beginning of our webinar education series. The AMA definitely wants to hear from all of you listening about any other questions. It sounds like we, after looking at all these wonderful questions that we have that we weren't able to answer, we can even have a part two. Um, and that's what we're, we're hoping to do, to educate our, our community um, and uh, to help uplift one another through, through a collective voice. So for those of you um, who are just getting to know the AMA or um, are familiar with us, please visit our website. Please become a monthly member. Um, your participation is what is going to make our organization stronger. And I want to thank Ratbook. Ratbook was one of the initial partners that jumped on board to support us. Um, and I know you've meant a lot to my uh, organization apostrophe and your support to the AMA has been invaluable. So, so thank you. Do you guys have any Final thoughts, um, words of wisdom to leave our, our community with today. Sure. Um, basically, if you guys haven't visited our site, definitely check out wrapbook.com. We have a ton of resources there from ebooks on film permits to deep walkthroughs to like, we have a whole post on kid fees if you want to read to your heart's content about kids fees. Um, also, if you do have a specific question that was maybe like very specific or just want to like reach out and talk about some sort of payroll question, definitely go to wrapbook.com slash contact. We have a form there. You just can put it, plop in your question and we'll, we'll try to answer the best we can. One last thought there. In addition to the payroll, Wrapbook also has an insurance agency. So for those of you with questions about general liability, inland insurance, and all of the strange coverage forms that go along with your DICE policy, uh, you can direct questions to us on that as well. I am an insurance broker. We have insurance brokers on the team. And we also, uh, we do underwrite and sell dice policies for producers. So if you kind of want to have it all in one house, uh, we're happy to uh, be that warm, the, the, 
the, your, the, your, your house and your, your, your operational partner for your work. So thanks everybody. Yeah. And from me, just thanks for having us. I really enjoyed um, just this whole session. Um, and Kelly, if maybe before we leave, we can get all the other questions that we didn't answer and I'm happy to kind of make sure I get those answers to you so that you can distribute them. Yes, absolutely. We will be sure to, to save these and, yeah. and make sure that we can connect some hands so that everybody ends up getting their, their, their questions asked. And by all means, feel free to reach out to the AMA as well as to rackbook.com forward slash contact to, to speak with them as well about any other unanswered questions. I think we put all of these links into the chat for everyone. Great. All right, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks everyone.